This is a panel on resuscitation. Now, that word could mean many things. What this really is is a panel on cardiac arrest. It's going beyond guidelines, going beyond the basics, going beyond what they teach the dermatologist to the most advanced, most cutting edge management of a patient in arrest. I am joined by an eminent panel who I will introduce in a moment, but before then, let me introduce our Twitter moderator who you've already met if you've been here for earlier lectures, Ashley Leibig, and she will be taking all your questions if you tweet them to at Ashley Leibig. So put anything you want me to ask the audience, Ashley will tell me when there's a burning question and we will we will pose it to our panel. Let's introduce our panel. We'll start from the left. And what you need to understand is if I just really gave these people the introduction they deserve, the entire time would be gone. So I'm going to keep it incredibly brief. So Steve Bernard, medical director of Victoria Ambulance, pre-hospital medicine, intensivist at the Alford, one of the progenitors of the modern movement of therapeutic hypothermia. Next, Sarah Gray. Canadian, emergency medicine, intensive care, hears voices in her head, does incredible work, um, and she uh, is most notable for her knowledge translation of all things critical care, specifically to the ED. Next up, Jim Manning, emergency physician, and creator of the SAP catheter, the Selective Aortic Arch Perfusion Catheter. He spent the past uh, more than a decade now researching it and trying to bring it to clinical reality. And you'll hear more about the SAP catheter in the course of the talk. Next up, Marek Kastrin, professor of emergency medicine at Helsinki, head of emergency medicine for uh, some of the biggest cities in Finland, and the chair of the European Resuscitation Council. MJ Slabert. British trained anesthetist and critical care doc, medical director of hospitals in northern British Columbia, and regional lead for organ transplant. And then, Lionel Lamo, anesthesiologist, reanimateur, and m perhaps most famous for doing ECMO pre-hospitally and actually cannulating someone in the Louvre. So with that, let's get started. My pronunciation was horrible, Lionel, but hopefully, okay. So, the first question I want to ask is a question that I am asking because I am personally burning to find an answer. We, we have all the descriptions of rhythms in cardiac arrest. Is this PA? Is it asystole? But that's, I think, taking it too basic a level. I think there's actual syndromes that occur during cardiac arrest. And one of them I frequently deal with, with much frustration, is the patient who has profound vasoplegia. They might have a blood pressure of like 130 systolic over 7 diastolic. Norm Parity's work would tell us those folks aren't coming back, but everything I throw at them, I never get that diastolic blood pressure up. Who on the panel has a solution for me? <laughs> well, you want to start up, Jim? Yeah. Well, okay, well, I'll, I'll begin. That, uh, at, at least in many of these instances where, where you've got really low diastolic aortic pressure, and, uh, and, you're, and you, you we're generally trying to treat that with uh, intravenous epinephrine. The problem is, is that the perfusion that we have is so low that you're probably not circulating the epinephrine that, that, uh, that you need to actually get a vasopressor response. So um, one of the things I've advocated, and I'm not sure this is going to be the answer for most people, is that we're in an age where we're really moving it more and more into endovascular and extracorporeal resuscitation. And I think that, that placing an aortic catheter and measuring the aortic pressure and, tr and and in, in, in administering the epinephrine or adrenaline intra-aortic very fast, maybe diluted so that you get rapid effect, might be an answer to this. Because some of these patients that you don't respond are simply because you're not uh, actually circulating the epinephrine. If you can circulate it or if you can get it out to the peripheral arterial system very, very quickly and titrate up to effect, you may be able to overcome some of this vagia plegia. You well, know, you were going to say something? Uh, yeah. First of all, I think we have to deal with the etiology of the, of the blood pressure. Uh, depending on the etiology, if you can treat the etiology, you have win probably. After you can treat fluid resuscitation to be more classical and some deal with epinephrine, norepinephrine, and after you can do something more invasive like uh, catheters or ECMO if you would like. 
Let's pretend folks don't have ECMO, they don't have a SAP catheter, they don't have Reboa, none of that. Is there anything we could do a little bit more basic? You can want to say something, MJ? Well, you know, occasionally you're faced with this patient that's literally arresting in front of you. Like you say, their diastolic is now 17. And uh, you just know you're about to start CPR. And I think it's preempting where you're going with this rather than waiting until they fulfill this criteria of now they don't have a pulse. And you, we all know if their systolic is 30 and their diastolic is 17 or 7, they are arresting. And, uh, you know, occasionally you just need to give them 500 micrograms of phenylephrine as you start chest compressions, right? You have to preempt these things and because you know where you're going, right, rather than be re reactive. You're absolutely right, and I should have been clear. This is my failure. Uh, this is a patient actually undergoing CPR. Okay. You've optimized it. You've done all of the basics as well as possible, but you just cannot get that diastolic blood pressure up. Uh, well, yes, but <laughs> let's, most of the people in the audience, <laughs> most don't have it. Uh, is anyone still using high-dose epinephrine? No, anyone, no. Nope. No. anyone no. using methylene blue? No. Occasionally. Yeah. Oh, tell, tell us, Sarah. Meh. So when you're down, there, the evidence is poor, right? You have to be at the stage where you're throwing the kitchen sink. Um, but it, we're, it's a nitric oxide uh, inhibitor, so it's going to give you a bit of vasoconstriction. There are only case reports of efficacy. Um, I've given it a couple times. It worked once. It didn't work the other. You get to that stage, you're giving calcium, you're giving bicarb, you're giving this and that, and uh, you know, like you say, the kitchen sink includes methylene blue. Okay, I find this so intriguing. So, ACLS, aside from a very small subset of situations, no more calcium, no more bicarb, and yet we all do it, I certainly yeah. do. How do, we, how do we deal with that, especially when we have some of our colleagues who may come and say, why are you doing this? There's no evidence basis, and it's against guidelines. Would you like to address this? You're one of the people making these guidelines. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And I've said today that, that it, I think that we should have more like a personalized uh, thing. Yes. And I mean, there's many of us have said today that how much more dead can you be than dead? So I mean, when we come to the fact that the protocol doesn't give us any solution, then we do something else and we use all the things and the tools that we have in our box, no matter if there's evidence to say that, yeah, that always works. How many folks in the audience would like to see what you've just said added to all of the society's guidelines? All right, well, we could work from there. All right, so people aren't excited about refractory vasoplegia. Let me say something I know they're gonna get excited about. Refractory ventricular fibrillation multiple defibrillations, you've given whatever meds you believe work, and we'll get to that. I know Stephen wants to talk about that a little bit, but for now, let's pretend you've given your antidysrhythmic of choice. They're still in ventricular fibrillation. Maybe you've tried a few. You tried the combo deal. They're still in refractory V-fib, and here's the key, Lionel, don't get excited. There's no ECMO at your hospital, okay? Because I, I know that we're gonna get there. So what now? How do you handle refractory V-fib? Who is doing dual sequential defibrillation? No, but oh, Sarah, you're <laughs> yeah. saving me here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah we'll, we'll do it, um, particularly for the refractory ones. Um, yeah, two sets of pads, two machines. I got the, I got the video from my, uh, my PhD students from Toronto, actually. <laughs> but I don't know how many in the audience actually knows what you're asking and what you're explaining. Fantastic. You, you're, you're doing my job for me. Don't Thank ask you. me to do it. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, so do you want to explain, Sarah, or do you want me to? Please. Okay. So, and we don't know the exact mechanism, but the idea is you're putting on two sets of pads or two sets of paddles, and you're saying to the person who has the alternative machine, three, two, one, shock. Now, some have suggested that what you're doing is you're adding to the amount of joules being delivered. I don't buy it, and I don't really think most of the literature agrees that's the method. More likely, you're hitting the heart from multiple vector paths, and you need a significant amount of the myocytes to actually get defibrillated in order to regain rhythm. So, so now you're doing maybe anterior poster and another set here and here, and you're gonna be having more vector paths hit with the defibrillation. So that's the idea. 
I would, I would ask uh, how, how many of you guys actually, when now when we have the, the pads that you like put on the chest and they're there in the same position, how many of you think after like three or four that you should actually change the position? Like we've done way before. Then if it doesn't work this way, we take them out and we put them in an AP. Oh, that and that many times that have worked. So I mean, we're too fixed that we put them in the position the guidelines show, and then we think that okay, and we know that the heart is not in the in the right place on everybody. You can say some, Jim. Yeah, well, I'd say I, I have done that before, where where we're in the middle of resuscitation, we've defibrillated a few times. I'm looking at the position of the pads and thinking. Maybe if we actually alter this, we'll actually get sort of the heart more centered in between them. And it's anecdotal, but I've had success with that a couple of times. Uh, I think that's a brilliant teaching point. So if you don't have access to a second machine, maybe you're in the back of the ambulance, maybe you're hitting better vector paths in a different position. I love it. OK, well, so, oh, please, MJ. Also, you need to think, am I in the right place with this patient? Uh, you know, should we go to the cath lab? You know, because they might not revert. And maybe the way to get them better is to go and cath them and take away you know, the problem. And uh, a lot of the cath labs have now uh, taken on patients who might be on mechanical uh, CPR. Uh, you know. So I think that's something you also have to think, am I in the right place? Like if you do this pre-hospital, you know, in someone who's in uh, res resistant v uh, VFAP, you, you should not call it in, in there. You, know, you should move and, and get them somewhere else. Absolutely. In fact, you, do you want, oh. Steve, do you want to talk at all about taking patients to the lab on mechanical CPR? Yeah, well, in the, it's our policy in Victoria, Australia, that uh, if we've got refractory V-fib in a, a younger patient, maybe under, under 65, um, ballpark uh, age, the idea of, there's a, a bit to talk about the drugs that we haven't talked about. Well, we're going to hit it. But the idea of uh, taking that patient to either ECMO centre, but if that's not feasible, the idea of transporting to cath lab is attractive. There's been a couple of case reports of transport from ED to cath lab with mechanical CPR. Um, I'm not aware of any case series, and we've done this, I think uh, we, we've offered this to cardiologists in our city uh, 30 times in the last 12 months, and they haven't wanted to, to take the patient to the cath lab. They have taken a few, but without success. So right now, I'd say that's, that's a long shot. All right, Jim. Just thought, um, when I think about refractory um, V-fib, I, I sort of think of them, or sort of split them roughly into two groups. There are those where it looks like the V-fib pattern, the refractory V-fib, you can't get them out of it, but the, cor the coarseness of the V-fib is not that great. The energy level doesn't appear to be that great. I think what we're failing there is we're probably, we're not adequately perfusing the myocardium to where you can successfully defibrillate them. The others are the ones that have what looks to be really high energy V-fib, and we've all seen this and go like, why can't we shock them out of this? I think those are the ones that probably have like a coronary occlusion or some part of the myocardium that's so irritable that you can shock them. You may actually shock them out for like one beat or before you even get your EKG back, they're back in the V-fib. So I sort of, I draw a little bit of a distinction, and those that have really good V-fib that looks like I should be able to get them out, I'm thinking that's a coronary occlusion, and those need to go to the cath lab fast. The others with, with, with that don't have coarse V-fib, more fine V-fib, I'm thinking this is a perfusion deficit. We've got to do whatever we can to improve the perfusion. And I mean, once again, when we talk about the culture and the attitude, the cardiologists are used to not having anybody die on their table kind of thing. And if we start bringing in V-fib patients, many of them are not going to make it. So they should kind of be in a culture where that's OK. Like the traumatologists are kind of OK when we come in with the very severely injured trauma patients that they die in the ED. That's more common now than it was 10 years ago. They should be the same with the PCI. It, it's such a powerful point. And in fact, in the US, even getting post-arrest patients cathed is damn near impossible in many states because it's considered a mortality against the uh, actual interventionalist. And yet, many of these patients die through no effect they had. Um, I, th I think there's an ethical dilemma to actually counting those in their statistics. Does anyone else deal with these issues? MJ, you wanted to? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it does take a change of culture and a change of minds uh, and an acceptance and uh, you know, to be fair, no one likes having bad stats against their procedure, but uh, you have to think 
out of the box, right? You have to think, why is this person in refractory VFib? And if the answer is there's a big clot, or I suspect, based on you know, his, uh, how he looks, what we've done, et cetera, his risk factors, if you then have to push him to the cath lab, we have to change the system, because if that's what he needs, that's where he has to be. Absolutely. All right, so they're still in a refractory defib. Maybe we've tried some dual sequential. We've called up our cardiologist. They're like, uh, not going to happen. And again, no ECMO. Uh, has anyone tried Esmolol? And has anyone had success? There's a case series out of Hennepin. Seems to have had uh, a number of successful cases for refractory defib. Sure. Steve, yeah. go for it. Yeah, and uh, strangely, uh, there's also a small case series of uh, isoprenaline, uh, which, of course, is completely counterintuitive as well. But uh, we have seen uh, on ECMO fibrillation gone going for an hour and an injection of isoprenaline uh, and straight into sinus rhythm a couple of times. It's an observation, but in this sort of situation, it uh, might be worth trying, but obviously not immediately after the esmolol. So uh, what, what Steve's mentioning is uh, in the United States would be isoproteranol. I'm not sure what, if there are any other names out there. And it's a beta agonist as opposed to esmolol, a beta blocker. Um, if you choose to do an esmolol and you want a justification, the idea is that perhaps all the epi that's been given, both by you and the pre-hospital services, uh, may actually cause too much beta for you to, them, to get them out of V-fib. You're looking for the alpha effects of the epi. The beta just kind of comes along for the ride, and we'd actually rather avoid it. So it's worth a try, because like everyone said, you can't get more dead than dead. If you're going to do it, 500 micrograms per kilogram IV push, and variable whether you go beyond that. OK, so we still haven't gotten them out. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about ECMO at this point, Lionel. What, how long should we wait on a refractory VFib patient before crashing them onto circuit? First of all, I think we have a, a problem of concept. The paradigm has changed. We discuss about stop a VFib. But what we would like now is to have some blood flow in the brain. The problem is not the heart today. The heart, we can do ECMO, grafts, what we would like now. But we would like to save a brain. That means bystanders, everybody do everything for the brain. That means you can live with the VFib if you can go pass away to a CPR. That means we change the paradigm. And we said, you have no ECMO everywhere. Yes, but now we are developed countries. For de developed countries, I think, if you know we can save a lot of life, we have to invest and stop to do to said is the earth first. This is not the earth first. This is the brain first. We have to change the paradigm. It's very important to have this knowledge because we discuss about uh, blockers after epinephrine. We had something for the earth. But what happened for the brain at this point? We don't know. We discuss about brain. It's more important for probably to have head CPR, head up CPR, and everything to save the brain. All the research today is to save the brain. For me, if we cannot reverse shortly a VFib, at minimum three shock, at minimum, 20 minutes of CPR with AED, for me, it's a refractory if you do amiodarone and everything. And after, we can switch for a CPR because we would like to save the brain. And if we're waiting so much to go to CAT lab and everything, we can do after the CPR. Because to do CAT lab under, EC, under CPR is very hard. And for cardiologists, it's very hard. They have a lot of clots. We have no flow in the artery. They can o not open a major part when we start to do that. After, before we have a CPR, we go under CPR because everybody said it's genial. We go. And what we've seen, the cardiologist said, whoa, <laughs> I don't know which artery. I have some clots everywhere. No flow everywhere. I have opened everything. Uh, for me, the sense is to protect the brain first and go in CPR first. OK. Let's go one by one down the panel. And very briefly, tell me what monitoring you put on during your cardiac arrest. Steve, what do, what do you have available and what do you use? Well, uh, I guess 99% of my experience is looking at pre-hospital cardiac arrest that the paramedics in our, in our city are doing in our state. And that's 2,500 a year. And really, we're not putting in intra-arterial lines in the field. So it's really going with uh, um, you know, what you see on the monitor. 
Um, and actually, we have a big debate within our service right now about uh, the current monitor we use, having that in AED mode, even for very experienced paramedics, uh, versus trying to get 100% accuracy from looking at the screen with minimal hands-off time. So that, that, that's an issue, but you know, for out of hospital, it's still just going with the monitor. All right, Sarah. Um, I, I guess in the emergency department, I have access to basic vital signs. We'll have end tidal CO2. Uh, if I'm up in the ICU, it depends which one I'm in, but we'll have an art line, a central line. If I'm in neuro, we'll, sometimes we'll have an inf uh, infrared spectroscopy uh, or a jugular venous sat. So you're not placing art lines during your ED codes? Not routinely. All right. Jim? Yeah. Well. In, in the emergency department, we were using entitled CO2 and monitors, standard stuff. But um, if I have a patient that I that based on uh, the rest of the emergency department have come in short downtime, and I really think this is someone that's potentially viable, I'll usually put in a femoral arterial line so that I can measure the pressure and also can and can float a, a catheter into the aorta so that I can give intraaortic epinephrine. All right. Well, we basically do what, what uh, Steve told uh, about uh, his system, but we have pre hospital doctors that usually make it to the scene, and then they have, of course, the arterial line. Do you have entitled CO2? Yes, we do. Okay, are you using that? Or yes. you're advocating they use that during arrest? Yeah. How, how are you using it? Um, well, I haven't been out there for a while, but I think that it's used to, to kind of see if like in a situation where you have to make a decision if, if, uh, if you should kind of continue or if it looks very futile. All right, so for prognosis. Yeah. MJ, what are you using during your rest? Yeah, so we've had a, a big move over the last few years to make entitled CO2 actually compulsory, and now people are really quite reliant on it, not only obviously for uh, intubation purposes and checking the tube, but also to see when we have to swap out our CPR people, right? Um, so when you see the entitled sort of slowly drifting up, it's not necessarily that the patient's getting worse, it's the person doing the CPR that's getting worse as well. And it's also quite reliable when you suddenly see a jump up, right? You know, there's, oh, perfusion it might be coming back. So, uh, yeah, a big reliance on uh, entitled CO2 intra arrest. You know? Exactly the same way. Uh, we have uh, some mobile ICU with Dr. Anfield. Uh, we use uh, vital signs, CO2, sometimes, but a few times on um, arterial line. Uh, but probably this is a new way to use more arterial line because uh, we discuss about EPI. Uh, this is a in cardiac arrest, we use one dose for everybody. That's amazing. We don't know what we're doing. We have probably to give some AP control by what we're doing in pressure, in fact, and probably IV, uh, and not a bolus like we're doing every day. Perhaps. Yep. If I, if I could say, uh, because I'll have a whole lot of paramedics squirming at home, we obviously use end tidal CO2. And it's important, I think, particularly because we emphasize supraglottic airway first. And that's one that you're just not sure whether you're ventilating the patient or not. And I think to see an entitled CO2 trace thin is reassuring. And then, of course, to check endotracheal tube. So just to be clear on that. Leonel, you said something intriguing, and it, it alluded to a point I was making earlier about high-dose epi, but maybe that branding of the idea I just sent everyone, no, no, we're not going to do that. But you're talking about personalized epi dosing based on the effects we actually have. If the patient has a diastolic of 60, they probably don't need any epi. And uh, like our earlier case, if they have a diastolic 7, maybe we'd give more. So are you doing that, and how much more are you given depending on the effect? Uh, in fact, I am completely agree, not fit all. I think this is a new message we have to do because we don't know what we're doing with the AP, and we know in the balance, the negative effect of the AP is the brain. It kills the brain, but we need some AP for the vasopressor. We have to monitoring. We start very shortly, a few dosage, and we increase, yeah, but we need our arterial line, and we're monitoring what we're doing. We cannot give some some dosage to start, but probably 0 0.1 milligram to start, and we increase short, very shortly, uh, each 10 minutes, five minutes, to increase the pressure. All right. I think this is a perfect time to take a brief mental break. So turn to the person next to you and tell them the absolute worst arrest you've ever encountered, and then 
if it sounds good, tweet it out to Ash and uh, she'll share a few of them. In the meantime, you guys have two minutes. Get drinks, because this is going to become a more fun panel with alcohol involved. So two minutes. We will hear more about your disaster cases at the next mental break. But Ash, could you uh, tell us a couple of questions that have come in from Twitter? Yes. When they're ready. You guys ready? Because you have about 10,000 questions in the last 30 minutes. So um, I, this, is, this is way worse than having to stand up there and give a talk. You're all on fire. <sighs> so OK, the, um, they would like to know about management of CPR-induced consciousness. Oh, that's a good one. Let's start with that. So who wants to hit this one? Patient gets compressions, wakes up, starts flailing. So you're like, oh, they're alive. And you stop. They go back to dead. Try this game again. And after a few times, you realize you have to do something different. So who's going to comment on what we should do? Just shortly comment on, on the fact that I've had some that actually doesn't really need full CPR, but just like tapping on their chest. Uh -huh. And then when you stop that, they fall in cardiac arrest. And uh, I mean, those patients, I've decided just to tap, talk to them, and take them to the PCI lab. OK. So that anyone have an alternative strategy? Steve? Yeah, yeah look, we've just published uh, some data on, uh, on uh, conscious patients from our, from our uh, database. What we found was that uh, there, there, is, uh, there were, I think, 60-odd patients who became conscious during CPR. And a number of them were given a small dose of midazolam. That group, compared to the other group, didn't do so well. Mm. So what we thought, we've got two-tier system. Our, our standard paramedics, advanced life support paramedics, can give opiate. So we thought fentanyl might be a better choice, maybe hemodynamically a bit more stable. And for our intensive care paramedics, uh, following, I guess, from the talk yesterday, who, they carry ketamine. They give them some ketamine. And the idea being, during CPR, the vasoconstrictive effect of ketamine is probably not going to hurt uh, and won't have, I think, the adverse effects of midazolam. So uh, we've, we've introduced that now, as, and we'll measure that over the next few years. And there's a protocol, actually, you could find in resuscitation that goes through the doses and all of that. You wanted to say something, Lino? You looked like on the edge of your seat. What we're doing for this case, we have exactly the same sometimes. Some people, we do CPR removing, we stop it, it's complete cardiac arrest. Uh, we're doing uh, general anesthesia with intubation in pre-hospital phase, and we, go to, uh, and we go to CPR if they don't respond. So what, what are you using for the general anesthetic? Uh, standard succinylcholine and ketamine. Okay. Angie? I, I just also like to say, I mean, we're very much into using drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and not everybody has access to general anesthetics or ketamine. I think the first thing, it might sound very wishy-washy, but is to talk to the patient and acknowledge that they are actually awake, explaining what's going on and explaining that you're working on a plan. Because, you know, even under uh, awareness in anesthesia, you know, there's a very... Uh, psychological aspect obviously to that and I think sort of acknowledging to the patient and sometimes you know we become very clinical and all of our drugs and things um, but I think just hand-holding very therapeutic explaining what's happening and that you're aware the patient is awake and you're working on a plan I think is as important of as grabbing some ketamine. Brilliant. Oh. And one thing if the patient actually goes back to VFib Wait a little bit because you, if, if you use the defibrillator, I did that once with like immediately when I saw the V-fib and the patient thought that I hit her and I couldn't run in the same ambulance because she was screaming every time she saw me. So wait just that 30 seconds so that they're really out before you. <laughs>
Wise advice. Yeah, oh, you wanted to follow on, MJ? Yeah, equally, you know, it is quite uh, frightening for everybody around when the patient actually wakes up, because that's the last thing you expect, right? Uh, especially if they're only awake and you still have to continue doing CPR. That actually, from a, a human side, feels a bit tough. And I think just acknowledging that, like, okay, guys, we know this is quite uncomfortable to everybody, more so for the patient, but this is the plan. Perfect. Oh, Jim? I, I did have the instance once where I was doing chest compressions on a patient and he literally was awake enough. He reached up, grabbed my hands and ripped them off my, er, his chest, which was really remarkable. Of course, he went back and started back again. And basically in that instance, I didn't wind up sedating him. I just tried to explain to him what was going on. And, and in fact, fortunately, we were able to shock him out of it. He stayed out of it after, after some amiodarone. But uh, happy to have that. There is one thing, though, that, that might be just a useful pearl is that if you have somebody that, say, like in a bradyacystolic arrest, you're doing chest compressions, they wake up like this. Um, there's an old, old sort of lost art thing of called fist pacing. So that it's, it's basically it's like doing serial precordial thumps. I mean, rather than just you know, doing chest compressions, you might be able to actually, until you can get a pacer on them, just thump them in the chest and you'll create an electrical complex and they'll actually maintain, uh, they'll, they'll actually have perfusion with that until you can get an external pacer on them. Also, another trick is as they arrest and they go into VFEP, if they're still conscious, ask them to cough. Because that's also been described, and uh, we do that a lot in the cath lab when they go into these arrhythmias, because they're all conscious, right? And you just ask them to cough, and actually that changes the intrathoracic impedance, and it actually does uh, do something to the heart, because uh, you can get, there is a description of percussion coughing. I love it. It's called, it's called cough CPR. Actually, actually, one of my mentors was the one who actually described it. And, and he had actually found that people who had been in the V-fib, if you had them cough vigorously, um, they could maintain consciousness for 45 seconds. And just a quick anecdote, my father actually had a cardiac arrest and woke up from it, but he kept having repetitive episodes. So when he had one, I actually told him to cough vigorously, and he kept, he kept missing all those shocks until I had him cough vigorously and was wide awake for one of them. He, he was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, do we have one more? Manual or mechanical CPR? Oh, perfect. Whoever asked that, thank you. Yes, let's hear from all the folks on the panel uh, what your feelings are about mechanical CPR. Uh, why don't we start with Sarah? We're doing mostly manual at my place. Uh, we've trialed a few devices, uh, and none of them have been adopted hospital-wide. And is that a cost issue, or they just don't believe in the efficacy? Um, well, truthfully, it gets, uh, that decision gets made above my pay grade. Uh, in, in Canada, it's probably a combination of both. All right. Uh, who else wants to address mechanical? Steve? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Uh, obviously aware of the trials, showing no benefit in the systems that we're using it. But in our state, we have huge rural area, and often one or two paramedics arrive at scene and this is an extra pair of hands. So there's a, a huge role I would see for a more austere environment. And the other is, as we've been talking about, we're now transferring a lot more patients to hospital on uh, CPR, and that's got to be on mechanical CPR. So I think two very strong indications. And then we keep it optional for, because we know there's no benefit if you're going to stay at the scene. But uh, I, I can tell you, uh, when you fit a device the scene vibe changes dramatically, and I think it allows people to think clearer, and uh, it seems to me arrests go a little bit better. Anyone else want to comment on? I think depending where you work, in fact, if you can have a quality, a good quality CPR, manual quality CPR, you can, you don't use mechanical device, but you have to be sure your quality is good. One of the major interests of the mechanical device is you are sure of the quality and the quality is constant. And I think it's very important to do if you have not a lot of people to do the CPR, not very trained and everything, I think you are probably, you can win some life. But if you have some team very training with manual CPR, we have enough people, you can monitoring what you're doing, I'm not sure you help us. Because you have to know when we use this type of device, we have some large problem for the ventilation. Because we are not synchronized with the ventilatory and everything. This is a balance, and you have to check for each critical rest where is the balance. Uh, anyway, uh, and one of the other problems is if you use ACD and ETD, 
you can have some difficulty with mechanical device because you have not the combination between the ACD and the ETD to have a better uh, increase of the pressure of the earth. Okay. How many folks in the audience by applause have mechanical CPR? Okay. And of those, how many find it to be a less chaotic code management with it? Well, somehow the ones who felt that way <laughs> was larger than the ones who have mechanical CPR. But that's, that's all good. Uh, anyone else want to comment on mechanical CPR before we go on? Okay. Let's talk about how long we should go. When do you say, stop, we've done enough, and is it different for inpatient and outpatient? Anyone want to comment? Do you want to talk about outpatient? When do we stop? Well, the, the outpatients, I know that Laurie Morrison from uh, Toronto has made a, a long journey in, in trying to find out when you actually should stop, or let's say when, when it's futile to continue, because that's the thing that, that not the stopping in itself. We've had in my area for a very long time, um, um, around 30 minutes if there's no, uh, like, if you have no results. Okay. You want to say something, Steve? Look, uh, you know, we're very blessed uh, in our state. We've got a 85,000 patient database and it's been looked at and it, it you know, obviously a dramatic decrease in ROS rate, um, but it does uh, cross the zero at 40 minutes. Yeah. So I think that that's hugely rare for someone to get ROSC after 40 minutes of good quality CPR. Did anyone else want to comment on this? Uh, I could Please. just shortly say that, that um, one of my PhD students just uh, had his dissertation about traumatic uh, cardiac arrest. And I think there we should think again, because uh, we, at least in my system, we've thought that if you have a trauma and you're found in a systole, you don't have a chance. But that's not really true. So I think that we should uh, try to find those that we actually should start on because there is survivors. Yeah, uh, there's in-hospital data that for those codes, uh, going longer leads to better survival and we're probably abandoning them too soon. Mm -hmm. And there's a good potential that some of these patients have small degrees of ROSC. When you see a PA rhythm and you can't feel a pulse, they're still perfusing. That may reset the clock. So, but then the, the question becomes, well then should we run it for two hours? Should we run it for three? So what do you use as your time to say we've done enough? Well, we haven't really changed our culture for these patients yet, so I couldn't know. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of like the ultimate question, right? What's the answer to the universe? It's, uh, it's difficult. I'd love to, you know, I think we've extended it because uh, most of the guidelines say do your best for 20 minutes. Mm, if it doesn't work out and you can't think of anything else to do and you've thrown the kitchen sink at them, stop. But now studies like that's coming out going like, 40 minutes, and you think back at some patients where you, you went for 20 minutes and you go like, should I have gone for 40 minutes, right? They stand a chance. Uh, so I, I think it's, uh, it's almost like the goalposts always changing, but it's, it's being aware of, uh, yeah, of, of that uncertainty, I think is, is important. And uh, we have to remember when we make rules and protocols, there will always be the exception and there will always be personalized medicine. Do you want to say something now? So in France, we have a doctor in, on the scene. That means they can evaluate each patient and they can take care of what they have on, in terms of physiology. Uh, but anyway, we, we, we continue now the CPR a little bit more longer than before because we have some, some survival later. But we switch now for a CPR very shortly. Anyways, I think one of the things is if you have some sign of life during the CPR. Because if you have some sign of life, that means the brain is alive and you can save something. If you have no sign of life and as historian, I think 20 to 30 minutes is enough. Oh, go ahead. And I, I know this is uh, a totally new ball game, but I heard that you're also responsible for the donor activities. And this is a totally new uh, area we are in. I mean, France has long already, uh, and Spain, I think, uh, brought in people as donors. So, I mean, then you don't stop, actually. So, when do you begin to do that in your system? 
Yeah. This is a new deal uh, yeah. to do some organ donation for non earth beating donation. And the quality of the organs is good too. And we have to keep in mind if the patient cannot be alive, he can save some other life. And we have to, to treat the patient if you enter in the protocol because it's a really protocol and very strict contrained uh, protocol. Uh, we have to take the patient to hospital and continue the care in the way for organ donation. And these are ECMO patients, right? Yes, but uh, well, it's different. Anyway, we have to, to, to know which patient go in each way. What we're doing now, we take the patient, and we have to select the patient go. If they go to ECPR, this is for save the life. But some patients go in brain death, and we can do some organ donation. But the primary endpoint is to save the life of the patient. But for some patient, we select the patient, we said, we cannot save the life. We insert exactly like an ECMO, but we make a balloon in the aorta. That means that the circulation of the, of the kidneys and liver, and just not for him, but for the society. Absolutely. Yeah. What we do need to say is that this will be different for every country, so don't go home and say we're going to bring patients to hospital for organ donation. Every country has, and there's a lot of ethics around this, but it is definitely a, a, a big change in, in thought process um, as we get better at, at organ donation and as the need becomes more as well, but we're not quite at Blade Runner yet, so um, you know, don't go to your local hospital and say, uh, you know, we're going to do organ donation on people in CPR. I, I, Sarah, I promised I wouldn't ask you any hard questions, but I'm uh, your friend. I'm going to ask you a hard <laughs> question. Uh, you get a 50-year-old female. She came in in ventricular fibrillation. She's still in ventricular fibrillation. Her end title is still good. It's like 26. They won't catheter. You have no ECMO. It's been 60 minutes now. <gasps> How long are you going to go? And how are you going to make the decision to finally say enough's enough? Is she normothermic? Yes. Because I'm from Canada, we get a lot of hypothermic arrests. Uh, and we'll go longer for those ones. Um, it's an hour? Yeah, it's 60 minutes. I think I'm done. OK. Anyone uh, going to do different or? OK, well, there we go. Now we have a number. Let's, uh, let's go to. Let's go to a controversial topic. Um, I, I mean, I'm loathe to go here, but I think we have to. Uh, We've moved in the pre-hospital realm to a concept that there's not that much extra the hospital has to offer. For the most part, the code should be run in situ and declared in the field. Um, and yet now with the ideas of ECMO and uh, mechanical perfusion strategies and all these other things, um, there are definitely a percentage of patients who probably should be transported to the hospital as soon as possible. Uh, Yiannopoulos just put out a work that they got three shocks in refractory V-fib and then were immediately transported. Your work's similar, Steve. So is, and I, I hate to use these terms because they're so loaded, should we be staying and playing or should we be loading and going? Who is going to comment on this? Well, I can start by saying that we absolutely should not do that on everybody, but we should try to find those that we should do it at. And as many have said, if you have something to offer, you have to make the decision pretty quick and not just then stay and play until you are quite sure that nothing's going to happen and then make the decision on, on taking the patient to the hospital. What, what's your, let's say you had ECMO centers, what would be your point where you say, okay, we've tried, now let's move? Well, we haven't really defined that patient group. And of course, it's like with everything. I need to be sure that the, the doctors and nurses in the ED, in the ICU, in the PCI, maybe in the operating room, are ready to actually quickly and aggressively take over and do something. Otherwise, why would I you know, go with blue lights and sirens to the hospital? Just so somebody can say, oh, no, we're not doing anything here. Anyone else going to comment? No, I, I agree. Having had that experience where you absolutely pour your guts out in pre-hospital and then you take someone in and they say, oh, what a lost case, you know, 15 minutes in cardiac arrest. Why did you guys do that? Oh, let's just pretend we'll go on for about 10 minutes more. 
uh, you know, it's, um, I think it's, it's a seamless transfer of, of care and, uh, you know, it, it is tr tricky to know who will make it. But uh, I think it's important to, uh, you, as you get experience as well, you develop a little bit of a sort of sixth sense of, you know, we are not where we have to be, where should we be with this patient? And it won't be every patient. Steve? Well, in our system, as I mentioned, we have uh, advanced life support paramedics. They can give the epinephrine and a supraglottic airway. So the occasional patient might not get an intensive care paramedic. And I think, therefore, the hospital has something to offer from intubation and amiodarone. Uh, but I think, as we were talking earlier, the under 65 refractory V-fib, the trialling of a couple of drugs that we've mentioned, plus doing a quick blood gas and is the potassium right too high, too low? That's something that can be pretty readily treated immediately. Uh, so there's a little bit for the hospital to offer in the young refractory V-fib. So we'd like to see those uh, transported, obviously, with mechanical CPR. Yeah, that just reminds me. I mean, we haven't mentioned anything about intra-arrest echo. Um, and I'm not really talking about trans uh, transesophageal because I don't think any of any does that pre-hospital. But it is a simple, easy tool. And a lot of the people before that we thought were in PEA and had no cardiac rhythm, or you know, now we find they're just in a low output state, just because you can't feel their pulse, you know. And so I think as we uh, we add to our skills and our uh, ability to, to treat these patients. I mean, intracardiac arrest, intra arrest ultrasound is not in a lot of guidelines yet, but yet it is something that a lot of us commonly do, and it does influence some of our decision making, and, and it is out there in the pre-hospital field now, you know, and they'll start trialing that as well. So I think, uh, like I said, you know, you need to have a reason to move, and you're not gonna move everybody, but that's a decision you need to take early. So when you, there actually has been a study of if you took young witnessed arrest refractory VFib VTAC patients, it would only be about 7% of all the arrests. So we're talking about a small subset that if you actually believed in the idea of moving to the hospital as quickly as possible, that wouldn't be continued to be run in the field. Um, I think this is a perfect time to allow our panelists to refresh their drinks. And for Ashley, do you, do you have one example of the worst arrest possible? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was still oh, focused okay. on questions. There's so many questions. Yeah. I think we're going to have to do a little rapid fire. Okay, well, why don't you hit us with some, some of them? On some easy stuff. It, hit us with some good ones. So, so let's, just, let's do some yeses and nos or some really quick uh, down and dirty. Um, uh, arterial lines and all arrests. Yes, no. Let's just go down the list. If you have the capability, yes or no. Look, in the ICU, in the ICU uh, and you're, I could count on the fingers of one hand in the last five years the number of patients who've arrested without an arterial line, so I guess so, but most in-hospital arrests we go to are on the ward, and it's not going to be feasible to place an arterial line, so okay. not, not, for, not for me. So, Sarah, dual defib, yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Energy level? Uh, 200. Or, what, or whatever you use. Does, uh, the, does the manufacturer say that's safe? Uh, I don't read that. Okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> my girl. It's my girl. Um, what happens uh, when our cath lab will not take patients? Can you speak to thrombolytics in these scenarios? Someone. Is a lot of cath labs not taking unstable patients? Oh, like, do you, are you li so licing the arrest if you don't have a cath right. lab or yeah. can't get them to cath lab? Or they won't take them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Okay. All right. That was easy. <laughs> Want to do one more? Um, oh, this is a, I'm interested in this one, so this is selfish. Um, persistently, meaning 20 to 40 minutes of high end tidal in asystole. Depending if you have some sign of life. If you have some sign of life, you can do something. No sign of life, nothing. Okay. Stop it. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's, let's talk about some more on medications. So let's talk anti dysrhythmics. We had the ALPS trial. It would be, I think, uh, valid if you said, I'm not touching these things ever again. Uh, I'm just ignoring them entirely. Or you could go any way you want. I know, Steve, you had something specifically to say about the ALPS trial? Yeah, I, I was uh, privileged to visit Seattle um, 
uh, earlier this year for the, the they run a master class uh, and uh, they, that's spread to Europe and now spreading to Australia and they did a simulation uh, of refractory VF and uh, they ran through and it was really a fantastic uh, display but their antiarrhythmic was lidocaine and Peter Kudachak who was the uh, uh, lead author of the ALPS trial, I asked Peter, why don't you use amiodarone? Because that's the international recommendation. And he said that uh, for the trial, the amiodarone was different to the amiodarone that's available commercially. Apparently not uh, have some, I don't know the, the name of the preservative, but did not have that in it. And given that that was equivalent to lidocaine, but the amiodarone that we all have now probably, well, it does drop your blood pressure when given as a bolus. So why wouldn't we all go to lidocaine? That's, that's I guess, a question for, for yeah. the international guideline so developers. How is ALPS going to affect the ERC? Just so you folks know, this was a randomized control trial, amiodarone, but we're hearing a different amiodarone, lidocaine placebo, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's long known that, that the drugs come very late in to the scene. So I probably would want to know if we would give any of the drugs that we use today very early. Now it's like, you know, 15, 20 minutes until most of us gives drugs because the algorithm goes that way. And I mean, when I started 1992 in the pre-hospital care, we gave beta blockers to everybody and we had good results. So, I mean, I don't think that the saga is over for drugs and I'm, I'm really interested in hearing what Gavin Perkins' group with paramedic uh, and adrenaline in a randomized control yep. trial with placebo will show us. Yep, and that will be the next set of questions. But does yeah. anyone else want to, what are you using, MJ? Yeah, well, I, I gave uh, lidocaine once in, a, <laughs> in, in Canada in an arrest, and there were lots of eyes going like, uh, we don't do that like that here, it's not in our protocol. So there's a lot of that. But I think with any drug, it's understanding the physiology and what you want to fix. You know, yes, there are algorithms for this, but this patient in front of you, what do you think is his problem? What do you want to fix with this drug? Don't give it because the algorithm tells you to. You have to know, and like you say, if you have to give it earlier, then why wait for the third shock, right? So I, I think, you know, you have, to, we, you have to engage your whole brain and think, what do I want to fix? What's the physiology? And you won't always know, but it's worth thinking about. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on anti-dysrhythmic choices? Oh, back. Well, I, I've, just, I've just got to disagree with that. Uh, almost all the cardiac arrests in the world are run by paramedics. And if it's individual judgment based on who knows what, I, I'm a bit of a strong fan that we run a, an algorithm and then that's what we can test against going forward. But if we've got amiodarone or lidocaine delivered ad hoc, I think the system falls apart, so. No, I, I, I agree with that. And like I said in my talk, the protocols form the skeleton from which all the flesh dangles. And if you, if you start going out of protocol, you have to have uh, experience in it. And I can appreciate when you work with a big group of people uh, who aren't necessarily experts in uh, going out of protocol or moving over to a naturalistic decision making, you should stick to the protocols. And obviously it's, it's easier to do studies on protocols. But if I have a patient in front of me in, in ICU or in the ER, uh, I'm going to think, what does this patient in front of me need as well? But there is the caveat, you need to have uh, experience and expertise in that. Um, otherwise the protocols are there for safety as a, a baseline and a skeleton. So don't uh, abandon it totally. Let, let's hear from the audience. First choice anti-dysrhythmic, Amio, any applause? <laughs> smattering, smattering. Lidocaine? <laughs> wow, I can't believe this. Placebo? All right, well, and, and then people who are just dazed and want to get out. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. 
<laughs> let's, uh, let's get to the, the real basics here. There was a definite shift in the ACLS guidelines from stack shocks, stack defibrillations, to uh, do one, do a little bit of CPR, recheck, do, but uh, that patient may have still been in V-fib after that first shock, and the next one might have been the one. Are we waiting too long? There are look-through defibrillators now that would tell us what rhythm they're in despite CPR. Are we missing the boat with these separated shocks? Who could comment? Nobody cares. Oh, oh, well, go. Go. I'll, I'll add in. I mean, I, I, clearly, if you, if you stop CPR, it, then, then you're going to watch your arterial pressure drop and you're going to lose ground. And uh, when I was, I was, I was fascinated. When, when I went into the field putting in aortic and thor th thoracic aortic and centromedial pressure catheters, I would actually watch this. And during a three-second three pause, just to see what the rhythm was happening, the aortic pressure would drop by 10, 15 millimeters of mercury. So it's a big deal. I think we always want to be trying to do chest compressions as much as possible. I th I'm, personally, what I do is I, I shock them and continue to do the chest compressions, look and see if the rhythm's actually been converted. And if the rhythm's converted, then pause quickly and look and see, do you have a pulse or not? But, um, but to just shock and wait what happened, then wait, shock again and stuff, I think you're losing ground with your CPR. All right. This, this, um, I don't want to bash proto protocols, obviously, but also, you, you know, the every two-minute pulse check, right? There are other ways of doing it, right? And uh, if you put someone through ACLS, unless they check a pulse every two minutes or every three minutes, you know, you might fail them. And uh, I, I just want to be an advocate for, for thinking medicine, <laughs> I guess. Um, I understand the importance for protocols, but I'm also um, think that you know there is uh, a level above that where you have to think. You know, is this in the patient's best best interest to shock him three times in a row? Is it in his best interest? You know, you lose all of that cardiac output, and all of the studies have shown that, right? When you stop to do pulse checks. So it's the same thing, right? The number of shock we're doing, I think we have to develop, and we have some research today uh, about the when exactly we have to do the shock. So that means we have to synchronize with the CPR, uh, and probably, you know, you have some study about the AMAC, is that the study of the wave of the, of the VFib and to track where exactly we have more lucky to have a risk after. And I think that means probably the next step. More than we have one, two, three, I don't know the number, but more than probably stay five minutes on CPR, 10 minutes, I don't know the time, but select the best time to do the shock at the best moment. I would, I would agree with that. So I, I, I make decisions about when to defibrillate based on a lot of what I'm looking at with the V-fib rhythm. And if, if you've got really coarse, high energy looking, let's say, increase, which would either be translate into higher median frequency or higher AMSA, I mean, those are the ones where I would think, well, now it's time maybe to shock. If you've got a really fine V-fib or it's not very coarse at all, I mean, you can shock them, but my experience with that is if you do get them out of it, they're going to either be asystolic or they're going to be in PEA. So it's kind of like, what does it really matter? So I, I look, I, I individualize based on what that EKG, what that V-fib rhythm looks like. All right, well, let's go with some more basics then. Uh, I think, for the most part, everyone, once a patient's intubated, has been doing continuous compressions. But now a recent trial, and the name is leaving me due to the gin and tonic, um, would say that 30 and 2 may be the way we should go even with an intubated patient. Uh, maybe that's better. Who could comment? And has anyone on the panel actually gone back to 30 compressions and two breaths on an intubated patient? No. No. So you're still going continuous? Absolutely. Yep. Consensus? All right. Anyone in the audience who willing to applaud if they're gone based on that recent trial back to 30 and 2? Oh. All right. We'll talk afterwards. Um, okay. Do we have a few more questions from the Twitter um, sphere? Let's see. Comments on timing of and target temp in TTM. Oh, that's my next topic. So let's skip oh, that one for okay. a sec. So um, the audience is a little bummed that there's no PD specialist here. Um, and they want to know about your resuscitation time for these patients. For our tiny humans, do you resuscitate longer? In? Pediatrics. Oh, God. <laughs> nope, we're going yeah. to skip that one, Ash. Uh, OK. <laughs> I'm going to resuscitate them until the pediatrician comes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well played. Yeah. Okay. I agree. <laughs> yeah. All righty. 
Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, if you, uh, the, what do you think about active compression, decompression, th uh, the rescue pod, and head up resuscitation? Oh, fantastic! Who who could hit this? It's probably a, a new step in the CPR. Uh, we need more study for sure. We have some data now from the lab. Uh, we have for rescue pod and. Uh, uh, ACD, we have now two major papers in clinical practice to say that when it's combined together, it's very well. But anyway, be careful. The ACD is very harmful because you need to be very trained to use it because uh, it's hard to use it. Uh, and for the head-up CPR, the first results we have are very interesting. And probably this is the next step too, but we have to confirm this this result because it's just on lab or few series, but it's very interesting because as we explained at the start, we changed the mind. The head up CPR and ETD and everything, it's just for the brain. It's to decrease the intracranial pressure and uh, that's uh, the, the goal of these techniques. Let me, let me explain all three of these things for the audience and then anyone else who want to comment can. Active compression, decompression, that just makes sense. It's essentially a toilet plunger on the chest that not only pushes down, but during the up phase actually puts negative interthoracic pressure. The ITD actually, with each compression, keeps that negative pressure in the chest. It's a allows exhale, but not re-inhalation through a device on top of the ET tube. So again, you're maintaining negative interthoracic pressure and causing venous return. And then head up CPR, you're actually doing the compressions with a mechanical device at 45 degrees. Seems counterintuitive. Less blood to the brain from the arterial side, but the thought is that it's actually venous congestion that's preventing brain perfusion. So if you sit them up, you get better venous drainage and then more potential for blood to come in. All right, anyone else want to comment on any of these three therapies or their combination? Well, I think like most folks in the audience, you know, who are busy clinicians, it, it, it's hard to really analyze the trials yourself. So the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation for the 2015 guidelines just looked at this carefully and said, not enough evidence. So for wh which of those? So that's for the uh, active compression, decompression, and impedance threshold device. But I think the sitting up slightly is more recent and you know, I don't think there's enough clinical data yet to say, okay, let's let's change our, our practice. Jim? Just a quick comment. I, I was um, I saw some presentations, some of the most recent science on this at the Wolf Creek uh, conference in uh, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, about a month ago, and they were looking at this sort of this combination. I think it's still probably true that we don't have quite enough evidence, and we don't really have the clinical evidence yet. But it is sort of intriguing to look at how these combination of these things. And I think they're actually getting to where the head is maybe not up but fully 45 degrees. They've actually been looking at different angles, trying to find the optimal angle. And I think sort of the combination. I mean, actually, the data looked pretty good that was presented last month. So. Um, I, I think we may actually find that if you have the capability to, to add these all together as the initial resuscitation component of it, I think it's probably going to make sense. But we still need more data. Anyone else? All right. Why don't we move as our last topic to post-resuscitation care. You get Ross now. Um, before we go in more in depth, I just want to go down the panel. We'll start with Lionel. What is your post-resuscitation temperature of choice? Or what, for Lionel, I'll say, what are you putting your ECMO patients on on the pump? Depending of when you have, when we have a ROSC, we go max 36, 34. That's good for us. Uh, when we are on ECMO, we go down 32 to 34 because we think this patient is a little bit different. They are more sicker and we have no data about this type of patient. We have just a few data from Japan, from the registry of Japan, and they found it's better at this temperature in 32 to 34. For when we have a ROSC, depending where we are in the ICU in Paris, but the consensus is to be always, we control the temperature to be under 36. Right. Fair enough. MJ, what's your temperature choice? We do the same, uh, 36 to 34. Um, and we actually found that it's relatively easy getting them there and uh, keeping them there for your period. The big risk phase is when you stop cooling them, they, uh, that risk of overshooting. Absolutely. Merit? 30, 32, 30, 32 to 34. And I have to say that I've been really disappointed in, in uh, realizing how misinterpreted uh, those uh, TTM trials and the results have been. 
and I know that, that Stephen has some uh, results from, from your area. The people tell in a big audience like this that now you don't have to call anybody, which is not true. You really have to check the temperature and have it so that they don't go into fever. So not calling is not the answer. We still don't really know what temperature it is, but we're doing it the old-fashioned way until we have much more results. Jim? We're still, in, we're still in the camp of like 32 to 34 until there's clear evidence that, uh, that 36 would be better. Sarah? Yeah, um, I still use 32 to 34. When, uh, when TTM first came out, we, um, you know, some of uh, my colleagues at, in Toronto were choosing the higher target and we tracked that data for a while and this is only our local single center data, but they were not able to stay in range. Um, there were phenomenally few patients where the patient didn't overshoot to hyperthermia. Um, so I'm still conservative. I still stay at the low dose um, because we are able to achieve it more effectively. Steve, tell us your temp and then tell us about the recent trial that goes along with what Sarah just said. So I think a TTM trial was a terrific trial. I think the results were clear and the methodology was, was fine, and I do think that 33, six hours post arrest, four to six hours versus 36 is equivalent. Um, the data you mentioned uh, has just been published, April in resuscitation was uh, in fact in a big ICU, our, our ICU is a very big ICU, 45 beds, 26 consultants, 300 odd nursing staff, um, the, uh, when we changed to, th to uh, 36, we did find about, I think the number was actually about 29% of patients had fever. And I think this is something that a whole lot of folks would not know or might not realise is that at 36 degrees, there's an intense uh, shivering drive. At 33 degrees, that's, that's absent. That's why we originally did 33, because there's no shivering in most adults over the age of 50. So that, that's the key. And in a big intensive care unit that really wasn't comfortable to use muscle relaxants in most of the intensive care patients, just, just you know, the, the local culture, uh, you've got to paralyze these patients in my view. And so when we found our data was that we were getting a lot of fever, uh, we did immediately change our, our protocols. Stuck at 36, but going with liberal use of muscle relaxants. All right. Anyone else want to comment further? Right. Can we have one more question from the Twitter sphere, and then we'll go on to my last topic on post-resuscitation. Um, well, first, um, I have to, I'm supposed to give a shout out to the Alfred ICU team for four minutes and three seconds is the time to beat at the Smack oh. Cannulate ECMO Challenge. Was that a burn on you? It is, sorry. it is, amongst other things. Sorry, yeah. sorry about that, sorry. I was tricked by Nixon. Um, uh, an interesting question that was posed earlier um, is with regard to text messaging or, and Merritt and I talked about earlier, or good SAM type applications for um, early CPR and um, defibrillation and what your thoughts are on those in, this area, in our regions. Who's going to take that? I, I can again. We were, Jim, you want to say something? Then we'll oh, go sorry, to Steve. Jim, Jim no. I'm looking, I'm looking at Steve. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> By yeah, look, I, I can say uh, we've just signed up with Good Sam, um, and I've seen the. Uh, can you, can the, you tell the, them what it is as well? Yeah, so it's uh, I guess just like Uber, um, it on your phone you will get a call if you're a registered, approved provider of CPR, and that would be different for different countries. But if you're approved, uh, you essentially get, and you're within about 300 meters of the patient, um, you can be called if you can accept, you accept and you walk to the patient and provide professional chest compressions. So, and it's Good Samaritan. Uh, the software looks like it works really well. It's already been used in a whole lot of cities like London, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in some places, similar sorts of uh, devices are used, for example, in Singapore in taxi drivers. I saw a presentation recently which looked awesome in that sort of city. There's a taxi always just 100 metres from you. So I think for most cities in the world, this is game-changing. 
This will give your patient professional CPR, and so when, you, when your team gets there, hopefully you've got a shockable rhythm. Yeah, things like that have made, made a big uh, difference in Seattle, where um, you know sometimes they have 24 people who say they're available. Um, so, and they, they have some of the best outcomes. Uh, so early CPR, as you said yesterday, makes the biggest, you know, it's nice having all the fancy stuff, but it's the person right there. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's, it's known from many studies that if you just plant defibrillators all over the city, they are basically never used. They're used in under 2% of the patients. So you really need to have somebody alerted to go and get one to the patient. That's the only way we can get those very expensive machines to be used in the right way. Yeah, that, oh, go ahead. That, that's the other thing in the Good Sam app. Actually, it shows you where the nearest defibrillator is as well. Or we could have drones delivering the defibrillators to us, which very well might happen. It makes a lot more economic sense than just sticking them in random places. I heard publicly. drones are kind of not reliable these yeah. days. Mm, <laughs> fair enough. Um, I don't, the timer's been at 15 for quite a while, so I'm just going to make this the last topic to talk about regardless. But um, is it acceptable for cardiac arrest patients or patients with ROSC to be transferred to smaller hospitals, or should all of them go to cardiac arrest centers where there actually are the resources to provide a very high level of care to put a patient on a mechanical circulatory device if they decompensate again to get them calfed. Should these patients bypass small hospitals and go to regional centers of excellence? I, I can answer that. Yes, they should bypass and they should go to a single good center like we've done in my area for seven different hospital districts. They all go to one single center. Can MJ. I, can I say almost the opposite because it's not Ooh. always practical. Um, I work currently in, a, in a, a hospital that's the regional accepting service for an uh, area the size of France, literally, and we don't have angio, we don't have cath labs, <laughs> we don't have cardiothoracics. Uh, our nearest transfer out is six hours away. Uh, even if you fly them, you can get it down to three hours. So it depends very much where you are. Um. We, we mm -hmm. just published in our station uh, this month. Uh, for a small center, we selected patients with poor pronosizing fat, without any co etiology, cardiovascular causes. Asphyxia or something else can go in the small center. But if you need to have uh, for good prognosis, you need to go to cardiac arrest center. But this selection needs to be done by a physician. Mm -hmm. And that's the system is different, and each system needs to adapt for where they are to go. Steve? Well, we saw a great presentation yesterday morning about how helicopters respond to trauma patients without even blinking. And it's time that they responded to post-VF arrest patients to get them to a PCI centre. So I'm afraid I disagree, I disagree with MJ a little as well. Uh, th this is what we're doing in our state now. We're not taking them to the nearest hospital. We're mobilising HIMSS, seeing them as the same priority as the more exciting traumatic brain injury. So that's, that's really, I think, a change in philosophy. But the, the data is crystal clear. They go to, not necessarily for PCI, but they go to that centre, and then if they need PCI, they can get that. Yeah. If they're STEMI, of course, absolutely, but even in STEMI post-arrest. But you might find this really strange, but I actually agree with you. That's why we're trying to work at getting a helicopter for our service, uh, for our region, for our part of British Columbia, as well as we have a plan in the next five years to expand and actually have a cath lab at our centre. The point I'm making is it's not always practical, and you know, sometimes the best place is in a healthcare facility rather than down the road for six hours. Sarah, what do you, what do you think? You're at a busy center. You have all the toys and goodies. Should they come to you or should they go to a smaller center first and then get transferred? Oh, I mean, I'm spoiled, so I, I work in a, a big academic center. Patients get transferred to come to us directly. Um, but I also live in Toronto, which is very dense in hospitals. You know, uh, Canada is what, 30 times the size of Germany, I believe. Um, there are huge parts of my country where you would need to drive hours just to get to the closest hospital, much less a cardiac arrest center. Uh, so there are huge tracts of my country where it's not feasible 
to go past the closest center. I think that's a perfect time to stop. Uh, before we applause for our panel, could we have applause for our long-suffering Twitter correspondent, Word. Ashley? <laughs> and then for the concentrated brilliance that is this panel, 